Hey. Tandem Computers Incorporated, manufacturing computer systems for online processing. Kara, favorites from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and KLIV, big bands and classic vocals. Man is strangely obsessed with refighting his old wars. He does it in books, in movies, and in personal stories that begin with, I remember when. Here at this small airfield in New York State, he does it by expensive make-believe. Big boys with big toys, reconstructing the legend and romance, but never the reality. Their replicas are precise. Their understanding of what it was all about is not. Fantasy is more fun than fact. In the minds of these latter-day aces, World War I was a time of chivalry, of champagne toasts before the dawn patrol, of scarves flying in the wind, of gallantry to the vanquished enemy. But far in the shadows of a pleasant afternoon at war are the ghosts of the men who knew otherwise, men who knew the bitter, bloody reality. The rules of their game were the will to live and the ability to kill. Men like Manuk, Bishop, Rickenbacker, Funk, Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron, the most deadly fighter of the skies. The First Great War burst across a continent shackled by social and military conventions. And to the generals, the strange new airborne devices were sometimes sporting, occasionally useful, and most often a nuisance. Aviation is good sport, but for the army it is useless, General Foch told Frenchmen on the eve of war. And in Britain, military pilots were those who had paid for their own flying lessons. It was never planned that the plane should be used as an instrument of attack. The first military flights were made not with bombs, but with observation cameras, which fitted them perfectly into the role in which they had been cast by the generals. But the pilots had a different conception. And two weeks after the war began, a German pilot reached over the side of his plane and dropped tiny bombs on a suburb of Paris. Warfare was being carried into the air for the first time. At first, it was simply those in the air against those on the ground. But inevitably, aerial greetings turned to crude forms of attack. At first, it was pistols. Then bombs were hurled by men bored with the task of reconnaissance. Soon, machine guns were hoisted awkwardly aloft by men who occasionally shot off their own propellers. It became a deadly game developed almost by accident. And it came not from the planners and strategists on the sidelines, but from the men who saw themselves as players in a fatal yet exciting contest. You see, the whole thing, as far as we were all concerned, it was an adventure. We were just there for the fun of it. And we were young, and the idea of flying airplanes and shooting from them and so on was a great adventure. My aircraft, when I first arrived out in France, I flew a B-2E, and it was equipped with a machine gun firing at an angle of 45 degrees in order to avoid hitting the, the air screw. Not a very effective weapon, as you might well imagine. Yet, in its own crude fashion, deadly. On October 5th, 1914, a German two-seater becomes history's first victim of aerial combat, shot down by an aircraft mechanic in the back seat of a French biplane. Gradually, the gun and the plane are merging into a single weapon. In 1915, a French pilot, Roland Garros, mounts a machine gun on the front of his plane and fires directly into his own propeller. To this propeller, he has fastened protective steel plates which deflect those bullets which strike it while allowing the others to pass through and onto their targets. 
which in the first 18 days of operation included four German planes that perished. Yet soon the metal protectors gave way and Garros shot himself down behind enemy lines. The Germans took the wreckage of his plane to Berlin, where it was turned over to a young Dutch designer, Anthony Fokker, 24 years old. Fokker decided that what was needed was merely a gear that would synchronize the propeller and the gunfire. And so June 1915 was the birth of a new and powerful form of weaponry, the fighter plane. Today they are museum pieces, but when von Richthofen faced these British planes, the Sopwith Camel and the Sopwith Pup were the ultimate in a kind of warfare beyond the imagination of those who had come before. Like the SE-5A, they could soar more than two miles above the earth and attack at over 100 miles an hour. The Newport, the deadly and much imitated French biplane, the Fokker, which was to evolve into the basic weapon of the famous Flying Circus. Today, the old planes seem almost too flimsy to be menacing. Yet in the memories of the old pilots, there lingers an aura of a deadly craftsmanship. I want to say one thing explaining about the World War I aircraft. As you can see, it is not a crate. I don't know where the word originated from. It was not put together with baling wire and orange crates and covered with canvas. No, we used the finest of Irish linen, and I believe our opposite numbers had access to, to linen of the same quality. Engines made the great, great difference in, in, in flying. The, the Wrights didn't fly until they had modified an automobile engine and get, which would give them the, the power they wished, the revolutions they wished for the weight value factor. And as, as fast as we could design aircraft for certain work, we had to be quicker to design engines to do it, to do the work for us. The men who flew them came to be known as aces, a new breed, masters of an evolving technology which carried them into a freedom and glory unknown to the men in the mud and the trenches far below. Men like Edward Mannock, the greatest British ace who shot down 73 German planes. A savage fighter who disliked publicity, Mannock took satisfaction in riddling a downed foe until plane and pilot were obliterated. Billy Bishop, the Canadian who fought with the British, second only to Mannock in victories, he would often spend most of the daylight hours in the air. In one 25-day period, he shot down 12 German planes. Albert Ball, who before dying at the age of 20, had shot down 44 planes. Solitary and intense, his spare time was spent locked away studying tactics while the other pilots were celebrating. And George Guinemer, the French pilot whose daring and recklessness in the air was matched by his cool arrogance on the ground. After having shot down 54 planes, he left on a flight from which no trace of either him or his plane was ever found. He was 22 years old. Of the Americans, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was the highest scoring. A combination of daredevil and businessman, he had already set a world speed record for automobiles, 134 miles an hour, faster than the best of the fighter planes he was to fly in the war. And Raoul Louberry, the French-born American pilot who was driven by a compulsive need for adventure. After drifting around the world, Louberry became a superb combat pilot. He died jumping from his flaming plane shortly before it plunged to earth. And Frank Luke, the flamboyant pilot from Arizona who spurned discipline and became a cowboy of the skies. He too died pursuing his greatest passion turning the huge German balloons into airborne infernos. For all the aces, death was the only measuring stick. Manfred von Richthofen, two decades before he was to become the most deadly fighter of the skies, with 80 planes to his credit. The Red Baron, a withdrawn Prussian aristocrat who forgets his private life to devote himself totally to his one obsession, flying. Even his friends could never fully unravel the complexities of the often solitary and brooding war hero. 
Born into the opulence of a country estate, Manfred von Richthofen grew up in a fading era of the lesser nobility. Manfred and his two younger brothers were part of a tradition that combined both leisure and the military. His father had suffered injuries in the cavalry, retired, married into money, and settled back to raise his sons. As a boy, Manfred was an indifferent student, preferring horseback riding to his books. At the age of nine, he discovered guns, and with them came the first passion of his life, hunting. Until he was sent away to military school, Manfred would spend hours alone on the family estate hunting small game. It was perhaps the only hint of the life that lay before him. For he hated the routine and the discipline of a cadet away from home. And when war came, it was only natural that he should serve in the cavalry, where he saw action in Poland and came under fire in France. Yet within months, von Richthofen had realized the obvious. The cavalry now belonged to history and its glory had passed to a newer breed of warrior. And so, in the summer of 1915, Manfred first went aloft, not as a pilot, but as an observer, a position he held until meeting the man who became his idol, Oswald Bulke, the 24-year-old pilot who already was one of the great German heroes of the war. Bulke was a superb leader, a daring fighter, and perhaps the best tactical innovator of the air war. In 1916, he set about forming a new and elite group, Yasta II, which in German means the hunters. He was free to choose from among the best of Germany's pilots. And among those chosen was an eager young pilot who had crashed on his first solo flight and repeatedly failed his pilot's test, Manfred von Richthofen. Bolke relentlessly drove and inspired his pupils. Into the chaotic skies of the air war, he brought a set of rules that came to be known as Bolke's Dicta. For months, the rules were driven home, and Yasta too received a training far superior to that of their opponents. The British approach was much more casual, as Archie Whitehouse remembers. I had been for a number of months in the trenches with the British Army. After a few months of that, I realized there was no future in, on the ground. And I, on one day, I saw a dog fight in which a small sop with pup like this behind me destroyed an, an enemy albatross, which fell not very far from where I was standing. That was the turning point of my whole life. The Royal Flying Corps are asking for volunteer machine gunners to transfer to the, to the Royal Flying Corps to become gunners on their two-seater fighters. And one Saturday morning, I arrived on this strange area of hangars and aircraft and people in different uniforms, just in time to see a Sopwith pup pull its wings off while stunting and auger into the ground right in front of the hangar to which I was uh, proceeding. But that didn't put me off at all. So I got into the front of this pusher-type machine, which was like getting into the front end of a bathtub, and was given a gun, flown around the aerodrome, taken off the ground for the first time in my life, and, uh, and told to fire at a target below. The target was three discarded aircraft wings, and uh, I was supposed to have put 47 rounds into it. And within another hour, I had shot down my first enemy aircraft. This all within six hours after leaving the trenches. In the fall of 1916, Manfred von Richthofen mailed a letter home. Dear Mama, he wrote, I have brought down my third Britisher. One's heart beats a little faster when the adversary, whose face one has just seen, goes down enveloped in flames. Von Richthofen is beginning the deadliest phase of his life. Yet of his first victories, most are easy, lumbering observer planes. But the rules and the training of Oswald Bulke are having their effect. The British are hard-pressed in the air, and the hunters of Yasta II are among the best pilots of the war. But suddenly, it all seems to end. Bulke's plane collides with that of one of his own men. They watch in horror as Germany's greatest ace plummets to the earth. 
von Richthofen writes that the funeral was fit for a reigning prince. Yet even before it is held, the grieving pilots of Yasta II set out on a frenzied search for revenge. They have become mad dogs, says one British report. On the morning of his idol's funeral, von Richthofen alone goes aloft. While the others are preparing for the ceremony, he seeks out a British plane and shoots it down. At the funeral is a wreath which was dropped by the British pilots. It reads, to the memory of Captain Bulke, our brave and chivalrous foe. For von Richthofen, the death of his teacher and hero is an ending and a beginning. He plans tactics and missions while his men are socializing. And on the wall of his room in the family estate, his mother now mounted a different kind of trophy, the serial numbers that he cut from the enemy planes he had shot down. Hans van der Osten, now the last surviving pilot from von Richthofen's small circle of friends. As a young man, van der Osten and the Red Baron flew together during the deciding battles of 1917. Richthofen cut chevrons out of the aircraft he downed, at the beginning for confirmation purposes only, so he would be credited with that victory. Later he did start a collection and decorated his quarters at the front with these trophies, if one may call them that. Only much later, a museum was created with these pieces, as well as anything else that might have been connected with Richthofen. Yet behind the thin veil of chivalry, there was the face of death and the serial hunters of all nations stripped their fallen prey bare. The quest for trophies has left a legacy of museum pieces like these, the personal collection of a single British ace, Major James McCudden. They remain today as quietly savage memories of an era that is increasingly shrouded in half-truth. In the winter of 1916, Manfred von Richthofen carries on after the death of his famous teacher. He evolves his own set of rules based on the teachings of Bulke, which soon leads him to his greatest air victory of the war. In late November, he shoots down Major Lance Hawker, Britain's best fighter pilot. It's a severe loss to the British, and the German high command suddenly takes note of the serious-minded young pilot with 11 victories. And in a war where heroes are needed for the morale of the home front, the process of creating a legend is begun by the information department of the German general staff. Von Richthofen responds almost instinctively. After his 14th victory, his albatross takes to the air as a bright scarlet challenge to the guns of his enemy. Das war zuerst wohl das Abschreckungsmanöver. First, it was to scare the enemy. Second, it was psychological warfare. But it was mainly his confidence of his absolute supremacy. For this reason, he had his plane painted red, and in part, those of his squadron, so that the squadron in the air was at all times recognizable as the Richthofen squadron. In World War I, a dogfight consisted mainly of between 60 and 100 planes milling around at the same level, fighting, colliding, and making the best of, the, of their opportunities to get out of it. Uh, I was in several dogfights, and in fact, I established, instituted one once. And there's nothing quite as frightening anywhere in the world. And you must understand that a dogfight as such could only be fought or flown by aircraft of this type, of this speed, and the maneuverability of these airplanes of that day. You couldn't have a dogfight today with planes that are flying 600 miles an hour because you'd be taking seven miles to make a turn, whereas we were making complete 360-degree uh, turns within only a, a, less than 100 yards. 
But a dogfight is exactly that. It's a madman's uh, night out. seems two hours. Actually, it's anything up to five to eight to ten minutes, but that is plenty long enough. And a dogfight was, was one of the worst things we, we dreaded, although at the time you're, in, you're doing it, or instances where you're actually reveling in it until you see someone go down or someone's wheels passing close enough over your head so that you can read the Dunlop sign on the tire. Their aircraft were always better, I, I think, than ours. They uh, were more maneuverable. Their guns were better placed in the fighters, except we had more aircraft than they had. We were able to cover more ground more often than they were, patrol more often than they were. Yet in the first week of 1917, von Richthofen finds himself facing the new Sopwith planes. They are disturbingly different, faster and even more maneuverable than his own albatross. This small, chunky-looking machine destroyed 1,634 enemy aircraft. It was a devil to fly if you were heavy-handed. It was a beauty to fly if you knew how to handle it. Nothing in the world could stop you with the stop with camel. Nothing except a flyer like von Richthofen. In just over a year, he downed seven of the Sopwith camels. It was a time of great glory, for in January of 1917, he won Germany's highest honor, the Pour le Mérite, known as the Blue Max. It was a medal he had long sought, and even in battle, it was to hang proudly from his neck. Mein Freund von Richthofen hat seine Erfolge in der Luft Manfred von Richthofen achieved his successes in the air, not for himself. He always felt he was doing his duty for his country. He was never interested in great personal honors. Near the battlefield of Vimy Ridge at Douai, von Richthofen takes over his first command, Yasta II. He is now living under the light of unceasing hero worship. His name and his image become part of the German public domain. But von Richthofen begins to withdraw. More than ever, he spends most of his spare hours alone or wild pig hunting all night in sub-freezing weather. He trains his pilots just as he had once been trained by Bulke, men like the partially crippled Schaefer, a hunter like von Richthofen, and the frail Kurt Wolf whose recklessness was matched by his skill in the air. And Karl Almenreuder, who also had idolized Oswald Bilke, and now, like Schaefer and Wolf, was to win fame under von Richthofen. Yet perhaps the best pilot of all the pupils was Lothar von Richthofen, who was trained under the protective eye of his more serious-minded older brother. They were a study in opposites, and at a time when Manfred was retreating further into his solitary nature, Lothar was showing the full force of his youthful exuberance. A friend once remarked, Lothar treats war as a cosmic joke. April 1917. Bloody April, as it came to be known. Even though Britain was developing better planes, most of the Royal Flying Corps was still equipped with antiquated BE-2s. It was an aircraft that was hopelessly outclassed by the Germans. For the British, it was the worst month of the year. He had better aircraft than we had. We were trying to fight back with a thing like called the BE-2C, which was a little 
biplane with two people, pilot and observer. And the observer had the gun. Well, the pilot had a gun, too, shooting through the nose. But, well, all Rick Dovin had to do was to come up underneath there, which he did time and time again, his pilots. They could shoot those things down half a dozen a day if they wanted to, you see? Well, when you've got that kind of uh, sitting ducks, you might say, it's not hard to run up a score. Well, some of the fighter squadrons used to lose 100% of their flying personnel in about four months. That's shocking, really. Um, in my squadron, in obs observation squadron, our casualties were not so high, but during the 10 months I was with the squadron, we lost about 150% of our flying personnel. And an awful lot of young lads were shot down within a, a few weeks of arriving in France. Largely because they hadn't gained enough experience to know what to do in the case of attack by hostile aircraft. But it was fatal to be caught by a fighting aircraft if you were diving for your own home lines. He gave the fighter pilot such an easy shot, dead straight line. I've seen too many youngsters. I talk about youngsters, I was only the age of 19, but inexperienced pilots making the mistake of diving for home and being caught and shot down quickly by a fighting aircraft. When you support Channel 54 and make a pledge of $100, we'll be pleased to send you this book as our gift of thanks. It's called Airplanes, From the Dawn of Flight to the Present Day. It's a complete history of aviation. Again, our way of saying thanks to you for making a pledge of $100 to Channel 54. Or if you prefer, for your $100 pledge, you can get either this book from the American Heritage Collection, The History of World War I, or this book from the American Heritage Collection, The History of World War II, or for a $150 pledge, you can have both of the World War I and World War II books. Again, for a $150 pledge to Channel 54. Good evening to you. My name is Terry Phillips, and I'm here in the Channel 54 studio. We're taking a very brief intermission from the Red Baron to give you an opportunity to go to the phone and give us a call here at 998-5400. Talk to our volunteers from the Italian Catholic uh, Federation and... Um, they will be pleased to take your pledge. You can call and pledge in any amount, uh, 54, 100, 200, as much as you can afford, as much as this program is worth to you. We are taking this very brief intermission from the program. We'll be getting right back to it. You're not missing anything. But right now, I'd like to throw it to my colleague in the studio, Gene Rusco from KGO Radio. Why don't you talk about how easy it is to pledge? Yes, I have come back here among the phone banks to make sure that all of these volunteers are kept busy. And the way to keep them busy is to call that number, 998 5400 and we have I'm surrounded by volunteers from the Italian Catholic Federation they are here to take your calls right now uh, we are getting a, a longer list of cities of people that have called in we thank you for that and you may notice that we have some balloons now starting to appear these balloons represent uh, donations contributions members wanting to belong uh, by uh, contributing $100. So every balloon you see is a $100 contribution. And we have some thank yous. Claire Hoover, we thank you for your contribution. That comes from San Francisco. My old stomping grounds gets on the board here. Uh, Claire, thank you very much for that $100 contribution to Channel 54. We're glad to have you as a member. And Richard Maine from Sunnyvale, also a $100 contribution. Uh, Richard, one of these balloons belongs to you. Because of your contribution, it has been placed up here. But we still have many volunteers from the Itali uh, Italian Catholic Federation. They are just sitting here. They're not answering their phones. Uh, why are you not uh, talking to someone here? Well, I can't talk unless those people out there start phoning us. My phone is quite a bit high there, and I need somebody to call. So we need someone to call at 998-5400. Ah, oh, there it is. See, you just got out of an interview because of that. And uh, so we have a whole bank of people. Here is a 
a young woman. Oh, I was just ready to talk to her, and now her phone rings. 998-5400. We have now heard from Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, thank you for joining us in this uh, drive for membership. Uh, San Jose, San Francisco, San Leandro, Menlo Park, Green Bray from Marin County. We're hearing from people up your way. 998-5400. Please, let's keep these phones ringing. Uh, Menlo Park, Sunnyvale, Campbell, Los Altos, Alameda, Newark. We're hearing from many more cities throughout the Bay Area. You still have a few minutes time before we go to the next program to call 998-5400. Terry? Gene, you know, these thank you gifts that I referred to earlier are available to both those who are new subscribers and for those of you who are renewing your pledge. You may get that same uh, thank you gift that we're offering uh, tonight by calling 408 998 5400. If, by the way, you're calling from outside the San Jose area, if you're calling from the East Bay, you can reach us at 415 465 5400. And if you're calling from San Francisco, try dialing 415 781 5454. In Carmel, you can dial 408 659. 5454. Whatever number you call, though, call us tonight at 998-5400 here in San Jose. We're waiting for your call and for your pledge. Public television is a great deal. You know, it's you get an awful lot for your money. The basic pledge of $25, for instance, uh, on a daily basis is just seven cents a day. Compare that with the cost of going to a movie, even buying a newspaper, and it's a wonderful value. Of course, part of that value is this booklet, Preview 54. This is our monthly program guide, and it simply gives you a listing of all of the programs, a lot of very good information about every program, some information about what goes on behind the scenes here at Channel 54, uh, as well as one of my favorite sections in the back, the repeat section, in case you miss something or want to see something again. It's all right here in this book, Preview 54, which goes to every regular subscriber to Channel 54. If, by the way, you're a student or a senior citizen, if you're on a fixed income, you can become a subscriber for just $15 a month. However much you choose to pay, whatever you can afford, whatever public television is worth to you, please make that pledge tonight at 998-5400. We need to reach our goal. Gene, speaking of goals, what is our goal? <laughs> I don't know where you are, Gene, but... What's our goal, Jay? Oh, yes, I am still back here. <laughs> our goal for this evening is $9,000, and uh, right before this pledge break began, we had just uh, achieved just under $2,000, so we still have some way to go before we reach our $9,000 goal. And now I'm starting to see these balloons coming in, indicating that we are getting $100 pledges. We're getting them from San Francisco. We're getting them from Santa Cruz. But we still have about $7,000 to go this evening in this membership drive. Please be on those phones, the number 998-5400. We have about, what, two or three minutes. Harry tells us about three minutes before our next program begins. That's plenty of time for you to get to that telephone and make your contribution to Channel 54 and the fine programming available. And here is someone that is not even on the phone right now. Is your phone working? I don't think so. <laughs> what, was, would somebody please call 998-5400 and see if we can get this phone to ring to make a contribution? Oh, there it is. There it goes. Good. We know it's working. Thank you for that call at 998-5400. Let's add to this list of cities. Terry? Gene, let me quickly uh, review the thank you gifts that we have available for people who make pledges of $100 or more. First of all, this book for a $100 pledge, it's a complete history of aviation. That's our way of saying thanks to you for making a $100 pledge. Or if you prefer one of these two books from the American Heritage Picture History of World War I, that's this book for a $100 pledge, or this one about World World War II, again from American Heritage. For a $150 pledge, you may have both of these books as our way of saying thanks to you for making a pledge. But call us right now at 998-5400 and become a subscriber. You know, a lot of our volunteers will be asking you tonight what company you work for. And we're not just being nosy, we're doing it because a lot of companies will match dollar for dollar or sometimes even two or three dollars for every dollar that you pledge. And among the companies who do this are American Express, AT&T, Bank of America, Coca-Cola, IBM, Johnson & Johnson, McDonald's, Western Electric, Tandy Corporation, and many others. This television station is truly supported by the community, not just individuals, but also companies in this community. So when you show your support, if you work for one of these or some other employers, your, your boss will show his support also by making a pledge to Channel 54. 
Uh, Jean is back there with the volunteers. They're pretty busy right now, but we still have phones available to you. If you get a busy signal, of course, please keep dialing. Uh, we want to be here to take your call and provide you with the most important thing that you're asking us for tonight, and that, of course, is programs. We'll be getting right back to the Red Baron. You're not missing a minute of it. Uh, please stay tuned, and in about a minute, we will be back to that program. In the meantime, please keep dialing and keep pledging. That's why we're here tonight. We do these, these uh, pledge breaks about oh, a little less than 1% of the total time that we're on the air. We try not to interrupt programs, but this is the most effective way that we have to keep this uh, public television station funded. You've shown us your support before. We come back to you from time to time to ask for your continued support. We thank you very much for watching and enjoying the programs. Thank you for your pledge. And Gene and I, along with the volunteers, will be here all night long. In the first week of bloody April, a new British plane appears on the Western Front, the Bristol Fighter. Six of them fly out of the mist over France, unknowingly followed by von Richthofen and Jasta too. In one quick engagement, four of the new British planes are shot down, two by von Richthofen himself. Some of the enemy pilots are beginning to call him the Red Devil. We used to escort effigies, as we call them, over the lines doing reconnaissance work and phot photography. And they were vulnerable, you see, under those circumstances. And here were these Hun fighters, a great mob of them milling around us, and one of them would come in and break us up. Well, Rechthofen in these red albatross, he climbed over top of us and dove right through the formation. panicky type, you see. We let him come in, and we saw him raise his nose into a firing position. Each of us circled around and dived on him simultaneously. And we were coming from both sides of the formation, and we very nearly collided. <laughs> let me tell you, he uh, turned over on his back, and he went spiraling down. And uh, that took a lot of um, and courage and everything else. Well, I was a, an, uh, an observation pilot. That is artillery observation most of my time, all the time. Fifteen months in France in that. First in the RE-8 and then in the Bristol Fighter. And you see, there's some misunderstanding on this point. Um, we were not trained as fighters. We were not trained in aerobatics. Uh, so that when we got into trouble, we didn't really know how to fly our machines in the best way to allow the observer to use his gun to best advantage. And I'm very sorry to say it, but I think that in many cases when we were attacked, we were subject rather to panic and to do everything we could to get away from the uh, uh, fighters' guns because we were terrified of them. And all through April, von Richthofen continues the terror. He and his men find a blind underside on yet another British plane, the RE-8. And on April 13th, their first encounter, all six of the new planes are destroyed by Yasta II. One cannot say that air fighting in those days was unfair. Naturally, one looked for the best positions to attack from, but one can't hide in the air and the red color of our planes gave us away immediately. April 29th, four victories in the same day. For von Richthofen, war in the air has become a matter of precise and surgical technique. For the British, von Richthofen is now a menace that must be stopped they decide to bomb his squadron at night. We could only do night bombing in moonlight. I mean, it might be cloudy, but the effect of the moon would be that you could see the ground, and so you could follow your course. So picture taking off with 12 small bombs underneath. So here we were, untrained bombers, 
no bomb sight, no mechanical aid, uh, groping our way, if you like, and we guess where we should release the bombs, and then with, say, 12 bombs up, you pull the lever 12 times. So that by the time you uh, uh, had released the 12, you were quite some distance further on. The night bombing causes little damage and has no effect. To the British, von Richthofen is now known as the Bloody Red Baron. At the end of April, he received word that the Kaiser wants to see him. For the moment, he must leave his natural surroundings and play out his role as national hero. He turns the command of Yasta II over to his brother, Lothar. And one week later, Lothar scores his biggest victory of the war. He shoots down Captain Albert Ball, one of the youngest and best of the British pilots. There is a strange similarity in the temperaments and personalities of Albert Ball and the Red Baron. Both are reserved, yet daring, and both are to die amid oddly conflicting claims for the credit of their death. A machine gun crew on the ground demands recognition for Ball's death, but official credit goes to Lothar, who remembers nothing as his plane crashes while he fights to stay conscious. As Lothar recovers from his wounds, Manfred sets grimly about the business of being an official hero. The crowds exhaust him, and the adulation that he has always wanted now seems oddly tedious. On his 25th and last birthday, he is introduced to the Kaiser and finds him a bore. He is hosted by Hindenburg and finds him also to be a bore. Public relations does not emerge as his most natural ability. It is only to the Empress that he seems to accord any genuine signs of liking. Von Richthofen returns to the front virtually enshrined as a legend. When his men meet him, they are informed that at the age of 25, he is now in command of a large new fighting unit, a Jagdeschwader. With the deadly humor of warfare, this unit is soon known as the Flying Circus. Jagdgeschwader, or hunting squadron, is composed of four units, each the size of von Richthofen's previous command. Its formation comes at a critical time in the war, and the flying circus finds itself being moved from one trouble area to another by a more desperate high command. And when the new German planes designed by Fokker arrived, they are found to be slower than the latest British aircraft. No longer are the German planes the technical masters of the air. Yet the specter of Bulka lingers on, and it is von Richthofen's superbly trained pilots who make the difference. In her last and bleakest year of the war, Germany found in the Flying Circus a daring, almost romantic group of heroes whose average age was 23. Werner Foss, one of von Richthofen's closest friends, was also one of his best pilots. And another ambitious young pilot showed a certain tactical brilliance. Hermann Göring, as did Ernst Udet, one of the most flamboyant pilots who survives to become an air marshal in another war. Ja, er beobachtete die Leute während des Luftkampfes. Das war eben, er hatte ein unglaublich He always watched us in the air, even during a dogfight. He had a fantastic eye for everything that went on around him. I remember one day I landed after a dogfight with an Englishman. And Richthofen came over to me, congratulated me on my victory, but at the same time, reprimanded me strongly for making one wrong turn during that engagement. Weil ich abgedreht hatte von meinem Gegner und nicht die Kurve rechts rum, sondern die Kurve links rum gemacht hatte. With outrageously painted planes, the flying circus taunted the enemy by their very presence. No other unit would dare go into battle with stripes and polka dots. Richthofen's were not all the same color. They had reds and blues and yellows. And, because I remember seeing him and his brother Lothar over Cambrai one day, and Lothar had a yellow one. But that was why they called it a circus, because it was all different colors. They didn't allow us to paint ours up. You painted your aircraft the, according to the regulations of the Royal Air Force, which was a kind of a, a, a dark greenish gray. The main base of von Richthofen's flying circus during the last months of 1917 was the old chateau near the Belgian town of Marke. 
It was from here that their fame and their notoriety spread first to their opponents and then to the world. All that remains are the few scattered airplane parts on the chateau steps, where once von Richthofen sat while recuperating from a nearly fatal head injury suffered in July of 1917. It was a wound that was to thrust even more feelings of doom into his mind. For even as the German press is engaged in a futile attempt to create a romance with Katie Otesdorf, his nurse, von Richthofen begins to worry about his men, about Lothar, about himself, and about Germany. Outwardly, the heroism continues. The Kaiser himself comes to Marke and proclaims that von Richthofen alone is worth three infantry divisions. But even that is not enough. The British are pressing hard, and America has entered the war bringing the full might of her industry with her. If American cars can be turned out in vast quantities, then so can planes, and the Germans soon begin to lose the battle of the production lines. At Marke, von Richthofen returns to duty, shoots down four planes, and finds that the dizzy spells from his wound still overcome him in the air. He goes home for several weeks of recovery and solitary game hunting. He returns outwardly confident, but inwardly more haunted than ever by images of his own fate. It is a fate that befalls those around him as the British planes begin to pick his friends from out of the skies. Wiegand falls and then Almenröder is shot down by a Canadian pilot, and Kurt Wolf, perhaps his closest friend and competitor, dies in the flaming wreck of the personal plane he had borrowed from von Richthofen. And then it is another close friend who dies, Werner Foss, the teenage ace, who alone dives into a maelstrom of British planes led by Captain James McCudden, who later wrote, as long as I live, I shall never forget my admiration of that German pilot who single-handed fought seven of us for ten minutes. He was the bravest German airman it has been my privilege to fight. McCudden's squadron trapped Foss just after he shot down his 48th victim. The young pilot twisted and dove to avoid the seven attackers. Other German fighters approached but were driven off. And finally, a burst of machine gun fire fatally wounded Foss, whose plane drifted, then stalled, and plunge to earth. With the death of Foss, von Richthofen is more than ever the unchallenged ace. And in the quietness of his family home, a line of tiny silver cups lengthens. They are engraved trophies that von Richthofen, with a Prussian sense of style, awards himself after every victory. But when his jeweler informs him that there is no more silver in Germany, the line of silver cups stops at 60. But by the end of 1917, von Richthofen is the only survivor of the original squadron formed under Bulke. And even as he regains his old form in the spring, downing 11 planes in two weeks, he senses that death is flying ever closer. He gives a note to his adjutant. It reads simply, Should I not return, Lieutenant Reinhardt shall take over command of the squadron. Manfred von Richthofen. April 1st, 1918, the Royal Air Force is formed. It is not the grandest of debuts. On that day, 10 of the RAF pilots perish, while 38 others survive in the wreckage of their downed planes. Over half are attributable to the Flying Circus, which has just moved to a new airfield known as Kapi, a bleak and rain-swept base that depresses von Richthofen who soon shoots down 2nd Lieutenant D.G. Lewis, who walks away from the wreck of his downed plane. Von Richthofen is even more withdrawn at Kapi, spending much of his time alone, revising the dicta of Bulke. He and his men find themselves part of a final desperate offensive. It began in the mists of dawn on March 21st with a slaughtering roar of German guns that leave bloody shards of men and metal across the Western Front. The British are forced to retreat. Their trenches have become shell holes and their supply dumps are holocausts. For the Germans, it is a final flicker of false hope.
April 21st, 1918. The rain ceases and the fog lifts at noon. Von Richthofen prepares to take off while a camera records what are to be the last few hours of his life. Outwardly, he is exuberant, joking with those around him. And yet, he has developed a morbid sense of foreboding because of the fate of his last 10 victims. All 10 have been devoured by flames. And in the lining of his flight suit, he has now secretly sewn 2,000 French francs in case of being shot down. When a mechanic approaches and asks for his autograph, von Richthofen replies, what's wrong, don't you think I'll return? And then he leaves on a flight that is still shrouded in mystery. is an RAF squadron led by a Canadian from Toronto, Captain Arthur Brown. Over the River Somme, Brown sees the Germans and dives to intercept them. Instantly, the sky is a kaleidoscope of attacking planes. But one of Brown's novice pilots finds his guns have jammed and breaks to return to base. Suddenly, a red triplane leaves the fight following the fleeing plane. From above, Brown sees von Richthofen closing in on his unsuspecting pilot, and he too gives chase. Von Richthofen opens fire, and a suddenly terrified novice sends his plane frantically skidding across the sky. He dives to 200 feet, yet still von Richthofen is closing in. But behind the Red Baron is the Canadian who maneuvers for position. The hunter is hunted. Planes roar toward a low ridge. Brown opens fire and is sure he sees the pilot in the red triplane slump forward. But other gunfire is heard. It comes from the Australian machine gunners on the low ridge below the faltering triplane. The Australians have laced the air with bullets, and they too are sure that they have found their mark. Pieces fly off the swerving plane which careens toward Earth. Across the Australian lines, the cry goes up. The Red Baron is dead. And within half an hour, his plane lies stripped like the skeletal remains of a beast picked bare by scavengers. The trophy hunter has himself become a trophy. And historians begin sorting out the controversy over his death. 25 re years of research, uh, I have come to the conclusion uh, uh, that he was shot down from the ground. But for the Canadian pilots, there is a different version. Richthofen had been heading up a formation fight, maybe seven or 8,000 feet high. And uh, these camels, in which Brown and Wap May were, were part of the attacking force, well, then Richthofen had been hit by somebody up there, you see, in this fight. And he started to come down. Brown saw him and started after him, see. He wasn't chasing Walt May or anything of that sort. He was trying to get the hell out of there and, and, and go and land someplace. And Walt got in the way. He wasn't shooting at him. Well, he was trying to land it. And then Brown gave him a burst and he finished it. And the Aussies were sitting on the banks right there, and they were firing away, but they never hit anything. You could find machine guns on the banks that far away when their craft going through. And then they claimed that they'd shot him down, you see. It's all nonsense. While an Australian eyewitness recalls differently. On the 21st of April, uh, 1918, uh, I was a signaler in the 29th Battery, first, first AIF. I uh, was mending telephone lines on the top of crest of a hill, right near the Healy chimney stack. Looking up, we could see that uh, three planes had broken away from the formation that were fighting. When they came right down near the ground, within about 50 feet of the ground, the last plane that was piloted by Captain Brown flew away to the right. And the other two planes, they carried on down the gully past us. There was a hill right in front of them. So the, the front plane piloted by Lieutenant May turned to its right and uh, the Baron, he turned to his left and was lost for our sight. And in a few seconds, he came up on the other side, just skimming the hill. 
and was uh, going for home, uh, which we, we would have been home in about another uh, 20 seconds or so. And uh, he, uh, he was passing us on our right about 300 feet up. And we could see him plainly sitting up in the aeroplane. From where he was, there was no other aeroplane within at least a mile. The fire evidently came from in the vicinity of Vosasson. And uh, now I drew the conclusion that it must have been Australian machine gun fire as they are maintaining the, that line about uh, seven miles long. And I should think they flew about four miles, which would only take uh, 60 to 75 seconds from the time when they left the formation up there until the Baron was crashed. Uh, when he was pa just passing us, we saw his head fall over to the left and immediately the plane turned to its left and uh, nosedived to the ground. And uh, when it hit the ground, it bounced and uh, about 10 feet in the air and, and went on another 50 yards. We uh, went up to the plane straight away. We were only really about 100 yards off it. And uh, when we got up there, we, uh, we didn't go right exactly to it until uh, some of the others came. And we could see that the pilot was dead. His head was lying back on the cockpit and uh, was definitely dead. Bert Angles, where the quiet cemetery has changed little from the Monday morning in April 1918 when Manfred von Richthofen, an enemy in life, became a brother in death and was buried by the British with the full military honors of a waning age of chivalry. He was uh, identified as the most prominent and famous of all the German fighter pilots. And uh, what else could you do? You would have to honor that, of course. I was quite sure that if any of our famous pilots had been knocked down on their side, they would have been accorded the same uh, honors. On the evening after the funeral, a British pilot flew over Kapi and dropped a small package to the stunned squadron. In it was a photograph of the grave. Die Truppe war natürlich sehr deprimiert, als bekannt wurde, dass Richthofen gefallen war. Aber der Geist. Naturally, the squadron was very depressed when we found out that Richthofen had fallen in action. However, the spirit of the squadron did not suffer, and the myth created by the name Richthofen was carried through to the end of the war. As von Richthofen had requested, command of the unit is turned over to Wilhelm Reinhardt, who dies a few weeks later while testing a new plane. Then it is the turn of the man who is to become a legend of a different kind, Hermann Goering, who leads the squadron for the last few weeks of the war. And when it is over, there is the final accounting for von Richthofen's men. Six of them have been captured, 32 have been wounded, and 56, including von Richthofen, have perished. And yet on the other side, the toll was far greater for the Flying Circus had shot down 644 Allied planes. From the neatly silent graves that mask the remembrance of men fighting for their survival has come a different kind of legacy. Wittmund, Germany, the home of the von Richthofen wing of the West German Air Force. And once a year, the old pilots who flew the canvas planes in the days of the Red Baron are invited here among the their times. 
and for others, they are perhaps just memories.